getting up early. Appreciate you being here, and I trust that the time we spend together is going to be profitable to us as we stop and think about this particular topic. Numbers chapter 14, beginning with verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. They spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? May we be blessed by the reading of God's holy word. Have you ever been in a Bible class and you were discussing something of great difficulty maybe to understand or maybe something phenomenal that transpires in the text and someone will say, well, you know, if we had have lived in the day of Moses or we had have lived in the day of Christ, why, I would be more readily able to believe. I, I could believe easier if I saw it firsthand, up close, personal. I've had that statement made in Bible class and when I was very young, I guess I kind of thought, well, yeah, that might be the case. But as I've grown older and as I've studied the scriptures, I've come to a totally different conclusion. Because the people who were the eyewitnesses sometimes, it seems, had the greatest difficulty in believing what they saw. And I can't think of anyone who illustrates this any more than you find with the children of Israel as they're being delivered by the great hand of God out of Egypt. And as they're being led toward the promised land that God has given to them. So I would suggest to you that eyewitness observation may not give you more ability to believe. Maybe you need to look at it from the total picture that God gives to us. I want to spend just a few moments in establishing how great the hand of of delivery was. You know the story, but let's review it a little bit. Moses is approached by God, and God gives him some insight into what he wants him to do with the latter part of his life. Moses is like a lot of us. He offers five excuses to God why he could not go down into Pharaoh's land and try to deliver the children of Israel. But finally, God in his anger says, you go. You take Aaron, you go. And then when he gets there, all of a sudden you see things happening that are beyond our ability really to understand or comprehend because they're phenomenal gifts that God has blessed Moses and Aaron with to convince Pharaoh that indeed he is the God of creation. I would think that when you looked at the first plagues that came upon the children of Israel, in fact, I guess I would have been convinced had I seen the serpent swallow the serpents. But uh, uh, the first plagues would convince Pharaoh and also convince Israel. Can you imagine when the water was turned into blood and all the land, what that would do to you? what it would cause you to stop and think about. Uh, Take that away and and give darkness. Would darkness not convince you? If you've ever spent just those 30 seconds or 15 seconds in the Carlsbad Caverns when they turn off the lights and you can't see anything, I could imagine that that would be a, a very difficult thing to have day and night, not knowing what's going on. If those wouldn't convince you, then surely the final act of God's deliverance in the plagues, the death of the firstborn. Surely that would cause you to stop and think about who is Jehovah God and how great is his power, how great is his ability. But with the children of Israel, that wasn't necessarily the case. They get to the Red Sea, it's time to cross, and they begin to murmur against Moses. They see the army coming, they're frightful. 
Moses says God will deliver and he does. Can you imagine what it was like to walk through on dry land over a sea that had been totally covered with water and I assume anywhere from 2 to 25 feet in depth for a long period of time and yet you went across on dry land. And then when you got to the other side, as the pursuing army comes after you, all of a sudden the sea walls collapse and the army is drowned. I would think I would believe. I would think I would say, my, look at how great God is and, and how great his power is. But that wasn't the case with Israel. You get to Exodus chapter 15 and you find that God has given them a great deliverance. They sing a song of worship and praise. They, they make some promises to God and then they get to the waters of Merah. They prove bitter. And what do the people begin to do? They don't see that God can deliver ultimately. It, it's kind of that mentality that says, what have you done for me lately, Lord? What have you done for me in the last few minutes? Well, food becomes a problem, they grumble. God answers with man and quail. God gives instructions to the gathering, the use of the man and quail. He says, here's what you do. Complete instructions. Do they follow those instructions? No. They have to learn the hard way. They do not trust God. They leave manna for the second day and they find the worms and the stench. They try to gather on the Sabbath. They find they can gather to no avail because God has told them you've got to double up on the day before. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes which I am commanding you today for your good. That was all the instruction they needed. And yet how many times after you read these words from Deuteronomy chapter 10 do you see the children of Israel not understanding and not believing? Moses tells them in chapter 11 and verse 7, your own eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord which he did. But they did not accept it by faith. You and I know how important faith is, how important it is for us to learn to, to trust God with everything that we are. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. So this is a very important issue that we learned how to believe in God. Well, this gets us to Numbers chapter 13, which is the basis of our thoughts, chapters 13 and 14. God gets them to Kadesh Barnea, and he wants them to go and survey the land. He gives Moses specific instructions about what is to transpire. Take one spy from each tribe and have them go and look things over. Why did God want the spies to observe the land? Good question. Was it so that they could see whether or not they had the power and the ability to conquer, or was it to whet the appetite of the people for the great promises of God being fulfilled? In verse 2, God gives the instruction to Moses, and he says, God is going to give the land to the sons of Israel. God has already declared his intent. He's going to give the land to to the sons of Israel. I would suggest to you that their purpose was to confirm the bounty of the gift of God, not to evaluate the possibilities. Every now and then someone will come up to me and say, Robert, have you been to a certain part of the country, maybe Alaska? Sue and I were able to go to Alaska several years ago. And boy, my eyes light up and if they're not uh, ready for about a 10 or 15 minute discourse on the wonders and beauties of Alaska, why? Uh, they shouldn't have asked the question. And, and I'll tell them all about it. I'll tell them everything that I saw. And I'll tell them about how wonderful it was. And what a great experience it was. What am I doing? I'm whetting their appetite. I'm getting them excited. 
We had a young couple at College Hill celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary uh, recently, and they talked to us before they went, and, and they came back and says, oh, it was just as wonderful as you described. We'll go again. I said, all right, let's go. I'm ready. You're getting them excited. But that wasn't what the spies did. You see, they confused their mission. Uh, they began to think that maybe it was their task to evaluate the reality of whether or not they could conquer. Faith is not entering into their way of thinking. Faith is not really causing them to stop and analyze who are we in light of the Creator? Who are we in light of God and His power and His strength? You see, I think we've got to, to be very careful that we realize that God has created us and therefore we are dependent upon Him and when he has promised, it's not our uh, mission to evaluate the promise. It is our task to accept and trust it by faith, to believe and to respond. There's a great passage in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 13, that serves to illustrate what many of the people of faith did in the Old Testament. Beginning in verse 13, all these died in faith, the scripture says, without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. And if indeed they had been thinking of that country from which they came out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is... They desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Stop and think about the faith that it took to look forward to promises that were not realized in your lifetime. And then stop and think about the lack of faith that was demonstrated by Israel in listening to 10 spies who gave an unfaithful report. You see, it's important for us to be a people of faith who believe and who trust. I think the problem to some degree, and of course we're in the development of mankind and their relationship with God, but the problem to some degree is that they did not keep a heavenly perspective about things, and that's a difficulty that I see in us today. We've got to keep our eyes upon those things which are eternal, especially in light of all of the pressures that come our way in the earthly issues that we have to deal with. We've got to keep a focus beyond that which is the here and now. I think Jesus serves as the ultimate illustration along this line. Philippians chapter 2 are some of my favorite passages of Scripture in the New Testament as Paul writes. He tells us to have this attitude or mind in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, Found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why, Lord, did you do that? Why did you leave the portals of heaven and all of the glories that are there and come to this earth? Because instead of having a heavenly mindset that says, I'm going to stay in heaven, he saw the need of man for heaven. He was willing to give his life so that you and I might be able to go home and serve him. I want to go back to the text of Numbers 13 and look at the way in which God gives the command to Moses and make some observation that hopefully will be helpful to us in understanding the sort of faith that we ought to have. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like, whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? 
How are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grains. Go up, spies. Look at this land that God has promised to you. Go up and, and, and look at, at, at the people and, and evaluate the cities. Look, look at how the cities are built. We know after the fact that God says that they went in and inhabited houses that they had not built. What a great blessing to go home and say, Martha, I found our house up there in Jericho or wherever they went in the process of evaluating. And so Moses is saying, get us excited, get us excited. And the spies come back and they give a half positive report. You remember, they brought the grapes and the pomegranates and the figs. In chapter 13 and verse 26, the text tells us that all the spies admit the beauty and the wonder of the land. But then there is that small word that means so much. Nevertheless. When I first began to look at that word nevertheless, I, I, I began to ask myself, now is this a word of transition? Or is this the beginning of doubt? And for them, it was the beginning of doubt. If they had have said, nevertheless, all of this is irrelevant. God has promised this land to us. Let's go and let's conquer. I think the story would have been a wonderful story of great victory, of great faith, being accepted and being trusted. But you know, all the ten could think of was the size of everything. Look at the size of the cities. Look at the size of the walls. Look at the size of the people. And terror filled their hearts. And the majority voice's message was, we only have grasshopper power. We do not have godly power. Sometimes I wonder if the Lord's church and the Lord's people today aren't still trapped in the mentality of thinking we can't when God has given us promise and confidence that we can. Go into all the world is very realistic because God has never given us a command we cannot accomplish. Not all was lost. There were two, though, Joshua and Caleb. Have you ever spent any time admiring these two great men of faith? Here's Joshua and Caleb and their statement to the children. We read it a few moments ago. If the Lord is pleased with us, key thinking, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. We know that Satan walks around like a lion seeking someone to devour. But I wonder how often he thwarts us because his roar is louder than the promises of God. Here's Joshua and Caleb giving the children of Israel every impetus to understand that the victory has already been determined. It is just a matter of you trusting God's promise and go, going forth and doing it. But you remember in our text, they wanted to stone them because they believed the ten rather than the two. And God suddenly reveals his frustration with Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me? Despite all the signs 
which I had performed in their midst, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 11. Well, the question that comes to my mind is why were they slow to believe? Why did they not have faith? If you've seen the plagues, if you've seen the Red Sea crossing, if you've seen the waters turn sweet, if you've seen water come forth out of the rock and a myriad of other things, why are you slow to believe? Well, old Robert's going to do a little personal interpretation and personal perspective on this situation. But I believe as you look at human nature today, the way we function and the way people in the world function, you can begin to understand why these folks responded as they did. They were slow to believe possibly because they looked from an earthly perspective, perspective at the circumstances around them. How often have we sat in a meeting trying to accomplish something marvelous and wonderful for the Lord's cause only to have someone say, well, you know, but circumstances and situations today are such that. And all of a sudden, you know, no matter what you're saying, it's kind of gone out the window. Because they had an earthly mindset, an earthly perspective. Everything is the here and now. What I can see, what I can touch, what I can feel. Even though they've already seen the great power of God. Earthly perspective can rob us of eternal glory if we're not careful. Listen to Peter as he tells us, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus. And as Paul writes to the church at Colossae, he says that you should set your mind upon the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, not on the things that are on the earth. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. Don't look from an earthly perspective about heavenly things. As I thought about this, I thought about the num numerous places where especially the Apostle Paul looked at the earthly perspective and warned us concerning its dangers. Let's go through this short compend of Scripture. Romans 1, 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Chapter 1, verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel. And Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. What message do you get? Don't have an earthly perspective. Look at things from the standpoint of God's promises and God's proof of his promises. Even the Jews of Jesus' day who were looking very diligently for the Messiah, when he came, looked at him through earthly eyes. Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 11 tells us he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Secondly, they did not devoid themselves of self-perceived power or strength. You see, I find that to be a very contemporary issue. Because I look at this world and I see people saying constantly, I can do it my way. Uh, do what you want. That's what's really important. We think of self sometimes as all-encompassing and all-powerful. Then the inverse happens to us. We go through with this attitude that we can conquer everything and we start failing. And in the end result with all of that failure and all of those limitations, we get to the point where we say, well, I just don't believe in anything anymore. And I hear that in our world today constantly. Self-power. You see, we're really not all that powerful. 
we really need to live with that perspective if God wills. If God wills. Isaiah talked about this in terms of, of the potter and the clay. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That which is made should say to its maker, He did not make me, or what is formed say to him who formed it. He has no understanding. Self-power causes us to ignore God on that same basis. The contrast to this is found in Romans chapter 8 and Philippians chapter 2. If God is for us, who can be against us? For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. If we are his vessel, created in his image, and we have surrendered ourselves to his will in obedience, and we believe and we trust, then what God says can be done, can be done, and will be done. It's up to us to be responsive. But then thirdly, I, I think that they were slow to believe because they were ruled by the negative thinking of the ten, and that pervaded all of them. Have you ever been in a, a situation where everything was so positive and upbeat, and in came one grump, and they said, yeah, I don't know about this. The room gets quiet, and in a matter of moments, instead of everyone talking about the possibilities, they're talking about all of the problems. I've had that happen a myriad of times in a myriad of settings. All it takes is a little negative thinking. Here's old Caleb and, and, and Joshua hand in hand, and Caleb is saying, let us go now and take possession. We shall surely overcome, Numbers chapter 13 and verse 20. Hey, here's the positive voice speaking out. There's compelling evidence. Look at what God has done. Look at all of God's promises. Look at how far we've gone and how much we've accomplished because God has been with us every step of the way. And he's taken up all of the inequities that we've had. The evidence was overwhelming. And then here comes the voice of the negative. Oh, the people are too big. This morning I was sitting in the coffee shop for just a few moments before I came over and, and I had just sat down at the table and there was a little 18 month to two year old a girl with her mother sitting over there playing. She dropped a toy right under my table. And uh, the little girl came to the edge and stopped and looked at me up and down. I imagine she thought, I have come into the land of giants. <laughs> and she wouldn't come over there. So finally I reached down, picked up her toy, and carried it over to her. And with great hesitation, she finally took it out of my hand. I wanted to pick her up and say, you know, I'm really not a bad guy, but I was afraid I'd scare her to death. And her caretaker, mother, grandmother, whoever it was, said, well, she's been told she can't go beyond the edge of the carpet. Yeah, the people are too big. I've been those places where I saw the giants. The fortification of the cities is too great. We are grasshoppers in their sight. Negative thinking. And all of this pointed to a failure to realize that God always makes the majority when it is his will. Therefore, we should learn to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and might, as Luke tells us in chapter 10 and verse 27. Jesus confronted this from an earthly standpoint in Matthew chapter 6. Earthly anxiety created by negative thinking. What shall we eat? How are we going to be clothed? What does Jesus say? Have you contemplated the birds that cannot control their destiny? Have you looked at the grass of the field that is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven? No wonder we are a people of little faith. We don't look at these events and see them for what they teach us about God's care and God's fulfillment. All of the things that God has created or at the mercy of God's use. And God is concerned with them. If God takes notice of the least members of his creation, the grass, the birds, does it not stand to reason that he take care of the needs 
of man created in his image. The secret, you see, is found in verse 33 of Matthew 6. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's where the blessing comes. You see, we need to have a positive attitude about our approach to spiritual things. I like to read the book of Philippians because it has that word joy and rejoice in it so many times. One of my favorite parts is in chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which goes beyond all comprehension. Shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But fourthly, they were slow to believe because they used the wrong standard of authority. Moses was appointed by God as their leader. Moses had faithfully carried out all of God's instructions, save one. Moses had demonstrated faith in their presence, trusting God. They should have seen God working in their deliverance. They should have seen that Moses as the leader when he told them what the Lord was saying would be an authoritative standard. It's not going to be very long until they see Korah and his rebellion in number 16. And they find the wrong voice of authority being consumed and destroyed. The ten spies were just the eyes. They were never the authority. And in this day and time, those of us who preach the gospel are the eyes. But this, my friend, is the authority. And we need to use this as our authority. Paul kind of expressed it this way as he looked at the foolishness of of those who would listen to every guru and every voice that comes along. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, In case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Jesus tells us that we need to hear his sayings and we need to keep them for he tells us I do not judge him I did not come to judge the world but to save the world and I know that his commandment is eternal life Jesus says Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. You see, the Word of God is authoritative. It is the living and enduring Word. And it instructs us that whoever speaks, let him speak as God's oracles or God's utterances. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. Well, let's take the last few minutes and look at some things that we need to make sure we are not slow to believe. When I posed that question to myself, the first thing that popped into my mind was the inerrancy of God's word. We should not be slow to believe that it is God-breathed and God-given. Our religious friends and neighbors are debating that issue, and that issue becomes our issue after a while. People beginning to say, well, can we really take this and believe that it is what God has given to us? I'm here to declare to you that if there's a single mistake in this, I can't believe any of it. I have to either take it all or none. That's why I believe that all Scripture is inspired of God, that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God is complete, thoroughly or adequately furnished unto every good work. Therefore, we should contend earnestly for the faith that has been once for all delivered. I think, secondly, we need to be concerned about the sufficiency of God's redemptive plan. I never thought that I would see the day in which people would begin to question that which I have been taught since I was a very young child about how God saves through the blood of Jesus. And yet, I'm hearing so many 
who evidently have not spent much time with the biblical text, beginning to question God's redemptive measure and how we are able to access it and respond to it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27 indicates that it is a matter of faith. And then it says that we are baptized into Christ and in that process we are clothed with him. There is no other way mentioned in Scripture. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 is that first gospel sermon was being preached. Repent and be immersed, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the purpose of forgiving your sins. Specified, he that believeth and is baptized, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. I don't know how we can question that. And I think we need to revisit and not be slow to believe the oneness and the perfection of the Lord's eternal kingdom. At home I'm preaching through the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 12. Here in a couple of weeks we're fixing to be in that paragraph that talks about the unshakable kingdom. Verse 28. I don't know about you, but... And all of the uncertainty of this world, I'd like to have confidence in one thing that just simply will not be moved. And my Bible tells me that that is the body of Christ, the eternal kingdom. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. We need to be very ready to believe the oneness, perfection the body of Christ, the bride, the eternal kingdom that God has given to us. A few years ago, a man came into my office and he said, I'm struggling, Robert, with some things. I've been a part of the body of Christ for a long time. I'm having a lot of discussions at work. I can't answer all the questions that people are asking. He said, "I, I, I just don't know. Is it really so? Is it really the truth? We talked about it for a little while, and it began to dawn on me that he had been raised in the church, but he really hadn't spent a lot of time with the Bible. So I made this recommendation. I said, have you ever read the Bible all the way through, from cover to cover? He said, no, I don't guess I ever have. I said, I want to challenge you to do that. Would you do that? And then come back and talk to me after you've done that, and let's begin to see how we can help you put the pieces of the puzzle together. And so he did. Read it through three times before we talked again. That was quite a phenomenal task, because it wasn't but just several weeks. And he said, you know, for the first time in my life, I'm seeing the big picture. I'm seeing one complete eternal story. And I'm here to declare to you that I believe with all of my heart. And I think if we, through the eye of faith, will read this book from beginning to end, we'll come to the same conclusion. We can believe with all of our heart. Are we slow to believe? I pray that if we are, we will repent and that we'll become steadfast. Thank you. We're indebted to Brother Waller for an excellent lesson on the area that is so very vital and consequential to the lives of each one of us. And that is that we need to have implicit faith in God. Robert, we really are grateful to you, brother, brother, for all your preparation. I really love Robert Waller, and I think that he is an outstanding preacher of the gospel, and we're thankful to have him in this area. We're thankful to have him teaching in the school of preaching. And if you've not met Robert, we hope that you will avail.